Hi, and welcome back to The Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases, and UK true crime. I have a little bit of a different episode for you today, as I've been lucky enough to speak to Jen Jarvie, who works as a death investigator, and has been researching the murder of Anne Heron that we covered a few weeks ago. Jen has worked closely with the family and has dug deep into Anne's case and has uncovered some interesting new evidence that I would love to feature on the podcast. I have spoken to Jen about how she got involved with the case and Anne's family, as well as a little more about her job role. It's rare on the podcast that we get to do update episodes and I'm really grateful that I spoke to Jen about Anne's case, as there has been some interesting recent developments. If you haven't already listened to Anne's case, you can go back and have a listen to it now, to give you some more context to this episode. As always, this episode does contain some descriptions of the crime and the crime scene, so listener discretion is advised. I first of all spoke to Jen about how she came to hear about the podcast and my episode about Anne's case. Well, I actually, I I was recommended the um, Unseen podcast because you did a case on the Whiston Boys Yes, I did, yeah. yeah. And I'm actually yeah. studying the, um, using the Wiston Boys case in my PhD. It yeah. was actually Debbie um, Lewis, Debbie Greenwood, um, obviously the sister who said, oh, you'll have to listen to this. So I did. Oh, really? So I sent her the link to yeah. mine and said, oh, you'll have to listen to this. So, yeah. Yeah. So, Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. You don't know who listens, do you? You know, when you put these things out there and you just have no clue, you kind of shove them out there and don't know who's going to come yeah. across them. Well, I, th- so, I think I think what's what's great is that she, she recommended it and said, you know, have a listen to this because this is exactly, you know, it's not glorified, it's not um, sort of misquoted in any way. And yeah, she, yeah. So, oh, that's good. Um. Anne's family uh, have listened to the unseen one are really um really happy with that as well so that's 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 a testament to you so oh. you know. that make, that really I really appreciate that because you don't you don't get feedback like that very often you know you, you kind of you do them and you think oh, I hope I hope no everybody's kind of happy with that and that kind of thing but that's yeah. really great to hear there, there, there are some we're not happy with <laughs> you know there are some horrendous ones oh. I thought you meant of mine then. Oh, oh gosh, no, 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 no. <laughs> sorry. No, 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 that's not, fine. Not at all. Some that have covered Anne's case that are oh, just okay. horrendous, just, just oh. awful. Um, so it's lovely, you know, to have yeah. you know, one we could go. Actually, yeah, yeah, that's... you've kind of captured it. So, which is oh, thank so you. Good. Um, and yeah. Peter's no, no, grateful as well. So no, I'm, um, I'm really, re- honestly, you don't know what that means to me. To be honest, that you know, it's so they've listened and they're happy with it. So that's. that's great yeah yeah that's 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 nice and that's two families as well so yeah yeah oh, I'm sure there are more out there I then asked Jen to tell me a little bit more about her job as a death investigator well I was just gonna say do you want to tell me a little bit about yourself because I kind of had a little bit of a, a google a little bit because I wasn't when I wrote the episode I wasn't really sure what a, de- a death investigator was yeah I had to kind of look it up I'd never really heard the term before so it, it is quite unique um, yeah. And it's unique because um, I'm only one of three people in the country to hold oh, wow. um, a degree. Uh, one of my degrees is in death investigation. Mm-hmm. And um, it's kind of medical legal. So, you know, you're looking at not just the investigation side, the criminology side, but mm-hmm. the medical aspects of it as well, psychological aspects. So it's kind of a bit of a, an all round, um, mm. specifically into murder, basically. So, um it causes quite a bit of stir, you know, at dinner parties and things like that. But that's, you know, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, so a death investigator, in my role, um, I'm um, a governing council member of the Association of British Investigators. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm the, actually the only female on the, on the GC, which is the governing council. And um, I deal with uh, purely historic cold case murders. That's all I deal with. So, um, so it's kind of a niche within the private investigation sector. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, I contact families or speak mm-hmm. to families of um, murders, usually at least five years old, if not more. Usually more like 30, 40 years, um, and either try to be an advocate between the police and them, or 
you know, investigate for them. Or sometimes it's a case of, you know, eliminating people, mm -hmm. which has kind of been a bit of all, all three with Peter's case. So. I spoke to Jen about how historic cold cases are often the ones that need more attention and some of the time do not necessarily receive what they need. These families in general have gone through the most horrendous thing that they've ever experienced in their lives. Yeah. And at the time, they've probably had a lot of faith in the police. They've probably had a lot of, um, a lot of admiration for the job that they do. But obviously, yeah. as the years have gone on, all of the anniversaries, you know, all of the birthdays, Christmases, they start to tot up. And then mm -hmm. when you get to sort of milestone um, anniversaries, such as like the 10 year, 20 year, 30 year, or even 40 years, with the Wisdom yeah. Boys, for example, yeah. um, you, you know, you get, you get to the stage where a lot of faith has been lost. Yeah. They have to take a back seat to new cases that come in. Mm -hmm. And they're almost forgotten and they're waiting, desperately waiting half the time, you know, for that call. And, yeah. you know, generally speaking, if it hasn't been solved very early on in a case, in, in a case's history, mm -hmm. the longer it goes on, the less likelihood that it is going to be solved. And these families are just left. That, I you know, know. It's, it's so sad. And, and quite often when I've been researching them, a lot of the times it is the 10 year anniversary, 20 year anniversary. And that's the only information that you then get. That's the only thing that you ever see. There's an, there was an appeal at 10 years an appeal at 20 years. And then that's, yeah. that's it. But there's nothing, nothing new. And I know when I've spoken to families before, you know, they kind of feel like, oh, well, you know we had a lot of media attention to begin with maybe or maybe they didn't have anything and then all of a sudden it's passed to one detective another yeah. detective yeah and it's yeah. getting that rapport with different people each time and telling and, the story over and over again and it's it's hard yeah. isn't it and I think as well as as this sort of the years progress you get junior officers who've worked yeah. on the case initially that then work up the rank mm -hmm. and then become SIOs and perhaps, and this is a general basis, perhaps mm -hmm. don't look at that case with fresh eyes because they can't. You know, mm -hmm. they've been part of it to begin with. And True, yeah. they are influenced, you know, un unfortunately, you know, it's mm -hmm. um it's a shame. It's a shame. But these families are just left and yeah. there isn't any kind of um advocacy for them. You know, there isn't there's very few no. charities, there's very few um aspects like that that can actually help them. There is obviously mm -hmm. for more um more, more modern or more contemporary cases. Yeah. But the orders quite often people go, yes, that not been sold. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. You know, um, or like you say, you know, unless you get somebody who perhaps champions it with a Facebook page or you know, um a, a podcast which we're really grateful for you know things like yeah, that yeah. it does get slightly more forgotten unfortunately yeah that's it, it's true and then it's things like records go missing they end up in cupboards in places which I've heard before and then just forgotten about unfortunately you know yeah. all the time and and these cases are never closed you know, they're, they're never closed. They're, no. There is no a statute of limitations on them, so they they, they remain open mm -hmm. but inactive and subject yeah. to regular reviews, and it's those reviews that, you know, aren't always as as thorough or robust, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, and it's a lot of it is based upon forensic developments. If, if the forensics aren't collected to begin there. with... They've got nothing to go by, you know, they've only got the sort of palette of paints that they started off with, yeah? Yeah. So so how did you become involved in Anne's case? How did you kind of, did you approach the family or did they approach you or...? Um, it's a bit, of a, a bit of a strange story. In fact, you couldn't actually make this up. It's, um, <laughs> I was sat on a, on a beach in Catalonia and mm. in August 2015 and I decided because I'd got various degrees and various qualifications that actually you know it would be really nice to start to use those um in mm -hmm. something other than just uh, lecturing so i decided to look at that case the local case to me um i lived in darlington for a lot of years mm -hmm. so and obviously it's just outside of darlington so you know it seemed the the most ideal case to start with mm -hmm. um it's durham constabulary's oldest unsolved case 
So, you know, you had all these different factors. So I started my own research and three days before Christmas that year, um, I had a massive house fire and all of my research went. At that point, it was like, right, OK, I'll, I'll just approach the family and I'll, I'll speak to them and obviously regather all of my, my research. But from, you know, the original source yeah. and approached um, Peter's daughter, Debbie, Debbie Simpson and Anne-Marie Coburn, which is Anne's daughter Mm -hmm. and um explained what i did explained what i'd like to do met peter and um nobody in that 26 years had ever approached the family and offered uh, nobody Mm -hmm. had ever offered to to help and it's it's sort of snowballed from there you know it's a built up of trust on both sides and it became very clear very quickly once i'd got that information um that you know peter had an alibi so you know, what else haven't you given me what what other information what's the golden nugget you know and he's like yeah. no, that, that's it yeah. so we've gone from sort of strength to strength from then um and we're a very sort of tight investigative unit <laughs> i think he oh. would find quite quite sweet to refer to it as yeah Oh, that's yeah that's quite an interesting so you, you had to kind of regather everything and, and oh, it, yeah Everything. It is sad that nobody had nobody in all those years had dug kind of deep yeah. into the case. I think that's that's the problem that we had that um, the media had kind of cottoned on in two thousand and five when Peter was arrested at the age of yeah. seventy. He was arrested mm-hmm. um, for Anne's murder, and all that they had, and and I I say this with. Um, the conviction of having all that information, all yeah. that they had was his DNA on his wife in his home that he shared with her. Jen explained that Peter's DNA had been found on Anne's body and told me a little bit more about what she knows about it. But in her house, where he lived, mm-hmm. with her, yeah. um, you know, when you sort of look at that, it's like, well, what, what else was there? No, mm-hmm. that was all there was. And that's why when, obviously, it, it got to the prosecution level and mm-hmm. the prosecutor, prosecuting barrister said, what else have you got? And that was all he had. And mm-hmm. it's a case of, right, OK, well, this is not, this is not a tribal case. So that's the lack of evidence, the fact that they didn't mm-hmm. have any. And I think anybody who lives with anybody else, if they can turn around and say they don't have... DNA from their partner on them in their home, you know, that that's literally all it was. But because the media obviously cottoned onto this, all oh, the husband's been arrested, really, really kind of cute theory at the time, very popular theory at the time, the husband or the spouse, it it never went away. And and Peter's name was uh, mm-hmm. even discussing, you know, with people 15 years later after that, they would say, Oh, he. He, he he went to jail for it, didn't he? He was like, no. <laughs> he mm-hmm. didn't. And I think people assumed that because he was arrested that that was it. Mm-hmm. And that it wasn't as cut and dry as, as everybody was kind of made to believe. No, it, sound, it, it, it does sound like quite a convenient way to almost to wrap up a case doesn't it and it yeah, is worrying yeah. it is worrying that you know any anyone could have that leveled against them you know if your dna is it, yeah. obviously your dna would be there i when i was kind of researching it i was thinking well maybe there's more to it you know what maybe there's some yeah. things that haven't been published that yeah you know because all that time later it seems strange that police would just decide in 2005 right that's it this is yeah. this is the evidence we've got and we're going to go for it it does seem yeah. a little bit unusual well it was exactly what I'd asked you know mm-hmm. you know it was sort of a case of right okay you've given me the prosecution files so I have everything that that, that the police had mm-hmm. you know to, that they put together and I asked the same question what which bit haven't you given me yeah. where's where's that golden nugget and that mm. that there, there isn't there isn't, there isn't anything um and it's I, I do believe you know sending six officers to arrest a 70 year old at the time you know who is, oh. was fairly frail then he's 86 mm-hmm. now um 
for a murder where they had limited, and when I say limited, I mean minuscule um, forensic information, um, mm-hmm. and not rectifying that is is it's slightly barbaric, I think, in my, in my view. I think it's just because it's less like that then, isn't it? Like you say, nobody actually knows. They'll go, well, yeah, they got someone for that. And it was the husband and everyone will kind of just think, oh, right, yeah, that makes sense. You know, move on kind of thing. And that's obviously hard, you know, for Peter trying to, you know, clear his name and say, no, it wasn't me. It's it's difficult to justify, particularly with that horrid phrase of insufficient evidence. Mm. There's, There's Leaves it hanging. Yeah, it's it's insufficient evidence makes out that there that there's, there's more, but we just cannot yeah. prove it. And in yeah. actual fact, it, it was it was so ridiculous what evidence that they had, you mm-hmm. know, that it, it, you've got to feel for the guy, you know, yeah. because all this uh, protesting, you know, mm-hmm. he can't he can't clear his name uh, in the media, and it's in that moral sort of court rather than you know in a, in a in a legal one. And you could tell that from the, obviously, they published some of the letter that he'd sent to Durham Constabulary in some of the articles. And you can tell that when you're reading it. And, you know, you can tell he's, he's desperate to try and clear his name. Yeah. Definitely. And and I think a certain kind of um, headlines, such as, you know, give me my day in court, does mm. sometimes, and I can understand how certain members of the public might turn around and go, well, how arrogant, you know. Um, but actually, it, it's it's not about that. Peter only ever wants and has only ever wanted two things. And Mm -hmm. the first one is to find out who killed Anne. He knows it's not him, so find out who killed Anne. And in that process, as a natural progression, obviously to clear his name, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah. yeah. But you have one one goes with the other. Definitely. Um, And I think I think that's what that's what your aim is, isn't it? To just find out who who did this. You know, if it wasn't Peter, who was it? I told Jen there were a few things that stood out to me about the day Anne was killed and asked her to tell me what she knows about the events on that day. If I started off with it's the hottest day of the year, uh, that year, that's how everybody remembers it, you know. Um, Yeah. uh, What was very clear very early on were the facts. So the Mm -hmm. facts were... Um, Peter had gone home for lunch as he normally does and he then returned to his work which is just down the road Um, he had been um, uh, requested to go to a meeting at at, um, a company called Cleveland Bridge which is um, just at the other side of Aeolian House in Darlington Mm -hmm. unexpected meeting um, at three o'clock so it wasn't planned he didn't know he was going there there's no big conspiracy He goes to this meeting and um, uh, finishes the meeting uh, at about 20 past half past four. Bearing in mind, obviously, that's, you know, um, between quarter past and half past four was the time that Anne passed away when she was murdered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, He then um, returns to his work, but goes the long way around and um, passes, um, you know, various different points gets back Mm -hmm. to work um and during that time it's believed obviously Anne was murdered Mm -hmm. um Peter's wearing a cream pair of trousers and a white shirt that he's worn all day Mm -hmm. it's same same outfit he's worn all day now anybody that you know wears anything like that will know Mm -hmm. if you wear a white white shirt or a cream pair of trousers you're bound to spill something down it you know that's just sort of like it picks up every little you know thing um, mm-hmm. He arrives back at Stiller's and sits in a brand new car. Mm-hmm. So any, you know, any different information that, um, or any, any forensic information would be on this brand new car if it had come off him. So yeah. um, you can't commit a murder like that and stay clean. You just can't. Yeah. Um, so he then finishes his um, day at work, returns home and obviously um, at at nearly six o'clock and finds Anne. And obviously everything explodes from there. Mm -hmm. Um, What we know from witnesses is that there was a quarter to five, there was the blue car. 
outside the house. So obviously it's there mm-hmm. from before quarter to five. It's just spotted yeah. at quarter to five. And at five past five, it comes screaming down the driveway, which is it's a long winding driveway mm-hmm. um, onto a, a fairly busy road. And um, the car turns right into and heads into Darlington at speed, nearly crashes into a taxi and a taxi. pickup truck. You know, um, nobody gets the registration, but they get a description, which is a, as they put it at the time, swarthy. Obviously, it's now a suntanned um, mm-hmm. male with black hair and that's shot yeah. at the side, slightly younger on the top and the back. Um, in a blue car, a blue saloon car. So mm-hmm. that's what, you know, that's sort of the facts of the case. Um, yeah. Anne is, um, obviously she, uh, she's uh, assaulted with a knife um, mm-hmm. in her home, inside the house. And um, it's, it, you know, it, it explodes from there. Yeah. So, they're the facts. You said you had two bits that you were curious about. Um um no it's just it's um reported quite a lot about her dog and the fact that there was no forced entry and that kind of thing is that is that true are they true facts or have they kind of been embellished over the years you never kind of know do you the the, the, uh, Heidi the dog um that mm. they had um yes Heidi was there um Heidi Mm. was a a lovely family dog um they were quite the same afterwards was a little bit more timid afterwards apparently um but yes the dog was there yeah Um, there it's been obviously sort of reported in certain places um Mm. there was no forced entry there was nothing stolen this wasn't Mm. a burglary yeah and this was one of your hideous opportunist crimes yeah. which yeah. are the hardest to investigate yeah um exactly because there's nothing to go on there's no you know backstory of there'd been an argument with somebody or it was you know yeah. and obviously in 1990 it would have been very diff- different wouldn't it to collect yeah. evidence and all well, that kind of thing cctv yeah um, dash cams if that happened yeah. today the guy be, would be yeah. picked up literally probably within hours you know Mm -hmm. um because of that many people with dash cams who who, you know who can have that footage cctv that can record them leaving even doorbell cctv you know just as kind of one instance um that wasn't available at the time so it was literally solid hard police work and Mm -hmm. don't get me wrong the police have a really really difficult job and you know i I completely admire what they do mm-hmm. because it's not an easy role and they're very no. quickly vilified you know, if they don't get it right. If they get it, if, if, if they do get it right, it's often congratulated but quickly forgotten. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, um, they were faced initially with this opportunist attack that they didn't know whether did they know Anne, did they not, um, mm-hmm. did she let them in, you know. Um, but that's one thing that we will never know. Yeah, because you know, um, but we can surmise from the whole incident that you know that whoever it was was driving this blue car. I asked Jen about the several witnesses who had noticed a similar car in the area that day. There, there was two who saw the blue car, which was the, on the day, which was um, the obviously the truck and the taxi driver. There's since been people who have um, fraudulently come forward and said that they saw um, incidents, you know, with the blue car, which have, have actually turned out to be complete um, fabrications. Mm. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really important to kind of piece together the ones that are right and the ones that are the yeah. ones, certainly the, um, the, the truck and the taxi, definitely. So what, who, do you know kind of who the police were looking at at the time? Because obviously Peter wasn't kind of arrested until two, the, 2005. So did they have anything else in the meantime or was it, were they not sure? They, they, they literally, you know, um, initially Peter wasn't, you know, wasn't considered. Wasn't, a, yeah. Um, it, or no more so than anyone else. Um, Obviously, when the um, notice of the affair broke, which 
to clarify, that wasn't um, an affair. That was two occasions, two indiscretions mm-hmm. with you know, the same lady and not this big blood and love affair that has kind of, or seedy affair that's been mm-hmm. sort of portrayed. Um, as soon as that hit, obviously the focus came round, obviously, to Peter, mm-hmm. um, who, you know, had, had no motive for it at all. Not at all. Yeah. Um, it's just they, the media always, ca- they always, they always jump on these things, don't they, and kind of blow them into... It's easy when there's nobody else to focus on. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really important to note that you know that that lady um, has since you know um, uh, has has a life now elsewhere, and you know the, she was never never a part of it at all. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But obviously, it turns the tides of, of the public's opinion as well, mm-hmm. and that's where it started to turn a little bit sour. Um, obviously, it, from Peter's viewpoint, but. No, they 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 didn't know, you know. They, 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 a... couldn't, they couldn't pinpoint this. Um, uh, who? Mm. It, it wasn't. It wasn't a. It wasn't a case that, that it was. For example, if it had been, if it had been an execution, if it had been a hit, you know, a gangland sort of organized crime hit or whatever. Um, there are certain modus operandi that they follow, you know, with a very clean, very um, skillful, very quick. Um, mm. Usually with a gun, um, they they don't sort of speed off down the drive and and kind of cause, nearly cause an accident. They're very yeah. cool, calm, and collected. So there were certain things that we you know we can rule out, but um, I think it was a case of when the crime watch appeal went out in the October that they were an understandably sort like most opportunist murders. They were running out of um, of, of leads. I mentioned to Jen that when cases do start to run out of leads, some people do start to come out of the woodwork with false sightings and tips. There are people that want their sort of 10 minutes of, you know, of infamy. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know with obviously instance with the blue car, there have been people who've come forward, you know, to progress themselves and things like that. And and it's not helpful. And um, it it, it sort of distorts um, the, the investigation. So do you want to tell me a little bit then about what you're kind of looking into and your investigation since? Yeah, well, I looked at it from, because I'm I'm a lecturer of professional policing at York St. John's, so I I teach prospective police officers. So um, I look at it from a policing um, model. Mm -hmm. So um, I would look at it as, an uh, you know, when I got this information, it was a case of, you know, being open-minded, Hence why, I, you know, I was very clear with Peter that, you know, if he had or if I found evidence that pointed his way, mm-hmm. then I was duty bound, obviously, to make sure that the police were aware of that. Um, yeah. and, and he was absolutely, you know, you know, dig as deep as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously, with this open minded approach using, you know, policing models, um, disseminated the case from start to finish really mm-hmm. you know from uh, the victimology point of view crime scene behavior um criminal um sorry crime scene analysis mm-hmm. um a medical legal forensic medicine point viewpoint and actually pieced all these bits together and um then decided that you know this this offense really really when you when you look at it as an independent a crime couldn't be somebody's um final act and it certainly wouldn't have been their first mm-hmm. so that brings you on to looking at you know who who is who's available at the time you know, who, yeah. is, who is out there and yeah. that includes people like um peter tobin he was even considered at one point Mm-hmm. Um, and it was actually Anne Marie Coburn that, that spoke to me about that, and he was quick, quite quickly ruled out. Yeah. Um, Christopher Halliwell has been considered by certain mm-hmm. elements, um, but the crime scene behaviour, the crime scene analysis, and the victimology—they don't fit his his typology. So mm-hmm. he, to, in my mind, he is very quickly ruled out. Um, so then you look at obviously your lesser known 
and hence where Benson comes along. Okay. So but tell me a little bit then about Michael Benson. What what do we know about him? What yeah. what have you found out? That kind um, of well, just obviously from the off, um, he died in 2011. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's why we're able to obviously name him. That's why we're able to kind of go public with that. Yeah. So just to be obviously clear, nobody needs to, you know, worry or fear him coming for any reprisals. Mm -hmm. um, he, um, he was born in Leeds and spent um, a great deal of time in Leeds and in the South and had um, an antecedent of um, a lot of very, very uncomfortable, and I say uncomfortable crimes, uncomfortable mm -hmm. when you compare it to Anne. So um, burglary initially, which is very, very common for people who have, um, have burgled, mm -hmm. to then go on to um, have incidents of um, thoracic uh, knife infliction so and that that's that's extremely common so we have burglary to begin with we then have robbery with a carving knife on several people um we then have um gbh with intent where he um he he shoots somebody that he works for or attempts to shoot them um he misses thank goodness but he um he then claims you know that, that wasn't me at all and it obviously it was mm -hmm. um he's waiting for the police to arrive and says i'm gonna have to get my knife because um for protection against the police so this is a guy who's who's, who's um psychotic he's psychopathic he has every antecedents going that would put him into that category mm -hmm. and um he escapes several times, twice, um, from prison. And the second time he escapes from prison, he um, gets married under an, a pseudonym, under a false name of John Stone, mm -hmm. Michael John Stone. He leaves his wife nine months later, having um, extracted £32,000 from her um, illegally, steals mm -hmm. her blue car and comes north. So we know he's in the area. Hampshire police didn't know where he was. We know he's in the area. We know he's perfectly capable of this kind of, of crime and that kind of escalation as well. So, yeah. yeah. So, scary guy. So how did you kind of come to make the connection between Michael Benson possibly having something to do with Anne's, yeah. Anne's murder? Was it um, the description of the car uh, and was it kind of his history or...? What was it that kind of led you down that road? Initially, it was one of the one of the main key points that the, both the police, the witnesses, and obviously my um, dissemination of the of the files showed. One common factor was that vehicle. It mm -hmm. was that blue car. It was the description. Nobody counteracted that. Nobody said, "Hang on a minute, it wasn't blue. It was green." Mm -hmm. Nobody said, actually, you know, he wasn't dark haired. He was ginger haired. Nobody contradicted that. Everybody agrees that that is sacrosanct. So taking the one um, core um, primary denominator between the, the, the three sort of opinions, mm -hmm. if you like, um, that was a starting point. And I happened to watch... Um, crime watch on youtube mm -hmm. you know you have it on have it on yeah. your mouth quite often and um Anne's appeal goes out and obviously it's really important to kind of you know make sure that you know a kiss inside out so i had it mm -hmm. it was playing oh you know we'll just leave it playing that's fine and november's issue comes up which is you know usually the recap of the month before mm -hmm. uh, when Nick Ross is telling you all about you know all of the things that they found yeah. and they put an appeal out Jackie um, Hamer puts an appeal out for a man in a blue car with a horrendous background she doesn't go into detail but she says with a horrendous background um that it has this description that you know may well be in the area is prepared to travel and it was too much of a coincidence to, to, to leave. So that was a, a, an investigative lead that I went down, looked a bit more into Benson's background, looked into his psychiatric reports and obviously his, mm -hmm. his, uh, 
his life and it started to sort of make more sense and Mm -hmm. the more that we've looked into it the more he fits so Mm -hmm. yeah I did find that interesting that his the segment about him was so close to the segment about Anne on Crime Watch that they were just it's strange isn't it that it kind of um happened like that really it's it's a bit bonkers I think that's Mm. the the way way that you can it's a bit bonkers that nobody at the time thought oh that sounds sounds familiar yeah Yeah, it sounds like last month you were looking for this and Mm. this month so are we yeah but because it was Hampshire and because it was Durham perhaps that's why but Mm. you know he 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 had not that communication yeah he had Mm. family that was living literally um 20 minutes from Darlington I was going to say, did he have a connection to Darlington? Would there be a reason why he would be there? Um, Yes, yeah, Um, which obviously his family that he had up here. um, Mm. I say up here because I'm up in the northeast. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, so he he had every reason to be here, but he had every reason to to travel because that's what he did. You know, he was he used to sell burglar alarms. (laughs) <laughs> yeah you can That's... see where this is going yeah um and obviously when the letters came up um some years later um they were considered by Durham Constabulary as um vivid and compelling um so are these the letters that somebody sent to the police and to the local newspaper and to Peter and to Peter. Yeah, so so they, they, they sent a letter, or two letters to Peter, one to Durham Constabulary and one to mm-hmm. the Northern Echo, which obviously they published. Um, yeah. So we're able to kind of look at that and take snippets out of it, which when we had our sort of prime suspect that, you know, we, we need to... We need to rule in or rule out. And mm-hmm. um, we look at the, we looked at the letters. Um, the the Durham Constabulary did pay a lot of um, credence to them. Mm-hmm. But because of the Yorkshire Ripper John Humble credence, you know, you've got, yeah, to, you've yeah. got to take it as a pinch of salt. Yeah. And um, the problem is when you start looking at that and you disseminate what's actually written. So um, what's written in the letters is a phrase of them bastards at Parkgate, pardon my French, but um, somebody writing that, it's quite obvious that they don't like the police because. Parkgate is where the um, police station is in Darlington. Okay. Um, they refer to them in that really sort of negative, nasty connotation. Mm-hmm. Only come from somebody who's been arrested previously, who's had dealings yeah. with the police and has has had really a quite awful dealings with the police. Mm-hmm. Um, Parkgate isn't referred. The, the, the police station isn't referred to as Parkgate. It's the Ring Road. Um, only people who don't live in the town would refer to it as Parkgate because it's kind of the area where the mm-hmm. theatre is. Um, he lived in Parkgate in Southampton. Okay. Leaving with his wife. Um, so linguistically, yeah. it's quite interesting, really, isn't it? That it There's these kind of doesn't point to things. someone as, yeah. that's local, necessarily. Well, he actually identifies himself as, I'm local. Well, if, he's, if you're local, you're local. You wouldn't, you wouldn't need to say. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's actually almost counteracting that and saying, actually, I'm local because I'm telling you I'm local because I'm not. Yeah, um, I want you to know that fact, but really, you know, not necessarily. Yeah, but really, I'm disguising it. Um, mm. And what's really interesting as well is at the end of the letters, you have two um, uh, sort of crosses mm. that, um, if anybody knows anything about um, prison tattoos, um, that actually indicates. Um, this is all summation, by the way, but that indicates um, uh, being in prison three times. And right. Benson had been in prison three times um, and had right. tattoos. So he may well have looked down at his hand and thought, you know, oh, what can I do to sort of antagonise this at the end of the letter? And has doodled. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's all sorts of different things that you can kind of link to it, but they are circumstantial links. Because we don't know. It does. It does seem like quite an angry, the quite angry letters, don't they? They do seem like they're there to try and wind people up, to try and get a rise out of people. Yeah, yeah. Mm. and even Peter's handwriting was taken. Several mem- family members' um, handwriting was taken. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 
it doesn't even come close. It doesn't even come near. It's 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 almost ludicrous to think Peter would have sent um, that letter. But he was ruled out. You know, he, he was ruled out of that side of it. Well, yeah, we we have to sort of place a, a very tenuous link with the letters that if they're real, um, and I have obviously samples of Benson's handwriting um, from 1972. Um, this is sort of separate to the ones that were reported in the Sun newspaper. Um, okay. I actually have that proof, and um, it's very very similar to his handwriting. I was going to say the art. The article did say, didn't it, that um, is it his ex-wife? It's one of his ex-wives. Said, <laughs> one of them. <laughs> okay, <laughs> who'd said that it was very similar? Yeah, um, it was. We we only have her word for it because obviously that that was sort of yeah. um, her into that. So she's got no reason to lie um, mm-hmm. at all. You know, she has no reason to. Um, yeah. I can I can say with uh, taking that sort of statement aside that I have samples of his handwriting from that time and mm. samples from his signatures and things like that and and there is um uh, visible similarities. Yeah. So where kind of are you going now with the case? You know are, are the police are you talking to the police are they kind of on board with the route that your investigation's taking or um, what can you tell me about it? Unfortunately, despite um, despite my uh, job role, so teaching police officers, mm-hmm. despite um, my um, academic background, um, you know, so I'm bona fide. Despite my in, uh, association of British investigators background, um, they are very very reluctant to take any information from anyone who's not a police officer. Um, I'm tier two vetted. <laughs> with the mm-hmm. police um from the met so you know this this is it, it, it's not just um any anyone that's that's how mm-hmm. i look at it um however this was presented to durham constabulary in september of 2018 mm-hmm. and october of 2018 um we had a discussion with um durham constabulary and they'd actually obtained familial dna for benson um, but have done nothing with it um, and have not progressed anything. This is, in effect, as I was told, it it has been put on the shelf. Now, we're in a situation where the, the second part of that two-part thing that, that Peter wants, um, obviously finding out who has killed Anne, mm. you know, I, I have a lifetime for that. Um, the second part of it, to clear Peter's name, you know, he's 86. He's yeah. an 86 year old, um, really, really lovely man. And I can't stress that enough, actually. He's such a nice I got a new job and he rang me up and said, you know, everyone else had forgotten I'd gone for the interview. And he rang me up and he said, Have you have you sorted out the pension there? Have you, you know, have you have you um how did the interview go? And lovely, really, yeah. really nice. Um, I can't, I can't, I can't speak highly or uh, any more highly of him. Mm-hmm. And but he's 86 and we have to be very very conscious that you know he might have 10 years left you know he might not and mm-hmm. to get that second half of, of that wish of his if you like fulfilled um we compiled a dossier to look at all of Durham Constabulary's evidence against him to actually say, look, look, he couldn't have done this. Can we can we give him that in his lifetime that you say we are not looking at Peter anymore? And the answer was no. Um, even though we can prove he has an alibi, we can we can prove he was somewhere else. Um, we can prove he didn't organize a hit or, or anything yeah. ridiculous like that. Um, and I can say with my hand on my heart, you know, he has a cast iron alibi. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're at with it. Um, we will continue, you know, to look down different avenues mm-hmm. and, and other crimes that Benson may well have committed, um, mm-hmm. which is highly likely. Um, up until obviously even after his arrest in '99, and subsequent, obviously after that, he died in 2011, um, mm-hmm. and didn't die in prison. By the way, died at home. So we do have that. Um, that scope for other cases where mm-hmm. you may well, and I believe is 
link to other cases but obviously we we can't go into too much detail with that but um but it wouldn't wouldn't have been his only case so that's kind of where we're at at the moment progressing this um and hoping that you know Durham Constabulary can can look at the information and just you know look at it look at it with that open-minded integrity that we want them to you know so do they have anything to compare the familial DNA to Oh. No, this is this right. is a crime where um, y- you you have forensic retrieval at the time, and everything that you have that you can go back to in a cold case is dependent on what they've actually retrieved to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, so there may well be, but whether that has degraded in that time, time. whether it's you know whether it's able to be compared, um, we we know that there is no. Um, DNA to compare to mm-hmm. that uh, that we can do that with. So you kind of had a bit of a standstill. Um, although forensics advances all the time, but there yeah. are forensic avenues that I have suggested that they go down, which they might. <laughs> I don't know. I... It's just a shame that they won't kind of even look into saying, you know, looking at the information you've done about Peter and, and and look at saying, look, it wasn't him. It's a shame that they're not looking at going down that route. I think it's just, it doesn't take an investigator to sort of piece it together to say, mm-hmm. he was in a meeting with three other people and those three people's statements all say, so-and-so entered the room at that point. You know, they all tie up, they tie mm-hmm. up beautifully, actually. Um, the receptionist who sees him leave um, and then the people back at his work, mm-hmm. you know, and all the time, remember he's wearing the white shirt and the beige trousers. Um, mm-hmm. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to kind of question, well, could that, could that realistically, you know, be him? Yeah. <laughs> um, no. Jen explained that she had a statement to read out from Anne's family about the case and investigation. Durham Constabulary's investigation into Anne's murder failed to identify her killer and after 30 long years we are still seeking the answers and closure that we desperately need. In our opinion, Durham Constabulary failed to meet their own high professional standards which compromise the quality of their investigation resulting in the situation that we find ourselves in today. As a family, we ask for nothing more than Anne deserved in August of 1990, a police investigation conducted with fairness, integrity, diligence and impartiality at its core. Anne's murder and the subsequent actions of Durham Constabulary have had damaging and lifelong effects on Peter and his family, which continue to this day, and we will continue to fight for truth and justice. With Peter now 86 and becoming increasingly frail, we thank the public for the support they've shown, particularly since the identification of a new person of interest by the family. An appeal for anyone with any information to come forward, however small it may seem. Your information may be the missing link that finally solves the mystery and brings the much hoped closure for Peter and his family in his lifetime. Heartbreaking. Yeah. It's awful to hear, isn't it? It really is, you know, so sad. But, you know, um, since the, the, um, the uh, article went out in the sun and obviously I'm from August and things like that. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, it's become increasingly more stressful for Peter. Understandably, he's 86. Yeah. And knowing that we were doing this podcast today, um, obviously, he know, I keep him up to date all the time. I'm in touch every day with him. And yeah. I told him, obviously, that we were doing this today. And, um, and he cried. He genuinely cried because it's like, this is, you know, I, I, I just want people to know the truth yeah. and help. Yeah, oh, that's it's it's awful that you've got to you've you've got to kind of do that yourself, and that there isn't that help there. That, that there isn't anybody there to kind of say, you know, oh, I'll, you know, I mean, you have obviously you've been a great help, but the police need to be doing a little bit more, I think, don't they? They need to be yeah. trying. I mean, I get that, like as you've said, it's it's a difficult position to be in when it is 
an older case and it's it's harder to find evidence but I think they just need to be a little bit more understanding with families as well I think, the communication I think is the difficult yeah, part yeah I think I think with everything that has gone on in the UK over the past year I think we've all become a lot more conscious of, of mm. our our elderly relatives and how how frail life is yeah. not just in the elderly but in you know people in their 30s 40s 50s mm-hmm. and you know to understand that this this could this could be anybody's family you know it, it could yeah. be it could be your granddad it could be your dad and, and when you know that it couldn't be them mm-hmm. not because he, they're, they're your relative not because they're your friend yeah. because you can categorically prove it couldn't be them and all they want is you know for, for, for somebody to turn around and say well actually you know yeah couldn't be you so that would mean that they're looking at other avenues and all I would ask is that you know if there is anybody out there that has that information you know that maybe doesn't want to go to the police that's maybe been to the police and we mm-hmm. have had this since since August. People who've been to the police and said, you know what, Jen, um, they they didn't do anything. They didn't even write my name down. Mm-hmm. Um, one chap I spoke to went to the police three times. And they 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 didn't want to take the valid valid information that he had. Mm-hmm. If that's the case, you know, get in contact, you know, and let yeah. us know. Um uh, let us, no matter how small it might seem, you know, um, if Where can you, people get in contact with you then if, if they have anything they might want to pass on, any information? Yeah, via via my email, which is um, jarvidis, which is J-A-R-V-I-E-D-I-S, as in mm-hmm. Jarvi Death Investigation Services, at gmail.com. So I'll make sure that's put on the, the link underneath um, this, if yeah. you like. Um, but... You know, it, it might be a case that, you know, you knew Benson. It might be a case that, you know, you were married to Benson. He has had quite a few wives. Um, you know, it might be that, you know, you had a relationship with him. Um, anything that comes to me will mm-hmm. be treated with, you know, the confidentiality and respect. Because 30 years later, life is very different. People's circumstances are very different. And that mm-hmm. would be completely respected. But anything that anybody has in that respect you know I would love to hear from them um and hopefully you know this will this will give you know the Durham Constabulary the opportunity to look at that information and Mm -hmm. appreciate that you know where we're coming from and a simple statement of I'm sorry a simple statement of we're not looking at Peter as a suspect anymore yeah um is 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 all that you know our, our initial kind of two-part uh, wish mm-hmm. merseyside police did it with the wisdom boys <laughs> you know they apologized they did they did something wrong they apologized mm-hmm. they moved on and now you know they're, they're obviously taking that from strength to strength so yeah. um I w- I w- that's what i would ask you know for them to yeah. prove their conscience few police officers have contacted me who worked on the case previously and Mm -hmm. their identities have been kept obviously very confidential um and I'm happy to speak to them and keep that confidence as well so Mm -hmm. yeah no that's that's great well hopefully somebody might be able to help somebody you never know as we were saying at the beginning you never know who's listening everybody basically from the Southampton um Leeds um borders so the Scottish borders Mm -hmm. um, Bridgend um and Bristol areas um you know that you might know him from um you might know him as Michael Benson you might know him as Michael Johnstone Johnstone um you know it might be a different name but you recognize the face Mm -hmm. um so um any anything obviously that that can help me you know it's going to help um, an 86 year old man and I yeah. think that's that's the main thing. Anne's case has remained unsolved for over 30 years and she deserves justice. I want to thank Jem for speaking to me for this episode and Peter and Anne's family for contributing and being supportive. I want to stress if you know anything about Anne Heron's murder or have any information about Michael Benson or his whereabouts at the time of Anne's murder you can contact Jen at her email, which I will leave in the show notes. 
If you would like, you can always contact me and I will pass the information on. You can find me at any of my social media accounts or at theunseenpod at gmail.com. All tips or leads will be treated confidentially and I will always respond to any information that comes in. All information is crucial in this case and I would love to see Anne's case get solved and for Peter to finally see justice for her. Anne's family deserve answers after all this time and I really hope someone comes forward. I would ask for you to share this episode or Anne's story wherever you can and I will be doing on all of our social media accounts including the discussion group. I will also be sharing photos of Michael Benson on social media so have a look and please share. I'll be back again soon with another episode, but until then, thanks again to Jen. I'm Caprice, and this has been Unseen. Unseen.